Hello, star people. Welcome back to Earth Sky. I'm Deborah Bird here with my good friend Marcy Curran. Marcy, welcome. Hello. Um, would you say that August is the best month for stargazing? I think it's my favorite month for stargazing for a couple of reasons. We've got the Perseid meteor shower. That rich, thick Milky Way is stretching across the sky. We've got the bright summer triangle. And in Wyoming, the nights are kind of warm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. So Marcy and I are going to tell you about four things, and she's already mentioned some of them, that you can see this month. So number one, the Perseid meteor shower. What have we got this year, Marcy? Right, we've got the Perseid meteor shower coming up. It's already actually, we're straying through the sky already. The storm is, act, the meteor shower is active through September 1st. It's gonna be best on the mornings of August 11, 12, and 13. This is showing you the radiant point, the, the spot in the sky where the meteors all kind of seem to emanate or shoot out from. It rises in the Northeast late at night and it will be highest overhead at uh, before dawn. So the best time to watch is always in the dark hours before dawn. And it's kind of important to remember, you don't need to watch that radiant point because meteors just shoot out in all directions. So just kind of glance around that area of the sky. And as we all know that every meteor shower does look slightly different. Uh, the Perseids are swift meteors. A lot of them are bright and some of them are colorful. And this picture was submitted to us by John Ashley, but you'll notice there is a bright moon down here at the bottom of the picture. Oh, and that reminds me there's bad news for the Perseids this year, isn't there, Marcy? There sure is. We've got a gibbous moon that's about 85% illuminated that is going to be basically in the sky the whole time the radiant is up in the, in the night sky. So the American Meteor Society, uh, typically you can see roughly 60 meteors per hour uh, during ideal conditions, you know, when you're looking under a dark sky, but they're suggesting we might see only 25% of, excuse me, about 25% of them. And so that means you'll maybe see about 10 meteors per hour. Uh, this picture actually has a pretty much almost full moon in the image and you can see he did capture a couple of bright meteors and this was submitted to us by Elliot Herman to our community photo page. But remember on that peak morning of August 12th, you'll get to see that conjunction of the bright planets Venus and Jupiter. Um, that's right. And the Venus-Jupiter conjunction is number two on our list of must-see night sky events for August. So these are the two brightest planets visible from Earth, and they're both in the pre-dawn sky now, and they're about to do something very spectacular. So here they are on the morning of August 2nd. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I was muting my phone. It's like, meteors! <laughs> um, okay, this is uh, August 2nd. And you won't have any trouble seeing these two because they outshine all the stars. In fact, they're brighter than anything else in the sky except the sun and moon. So I live in a very light polluted city and I've been watching Venus and Jupiter every clear morning for about a week now. And Venus is pretty high up in the Eastern sky before sunrise. Jupiter for me has just come into view, but here's the fun thing, Jupiter is moving up in the sky and Venus is moving down, getting a little closer to the sunrise every day. And now watch what happens. Boom, their conjunction when they'll be closest on our sky's dome will come on August 12th. So if you miss it on August 12th, the 11th is great, the 13th is great. And what do we know about the 11th, 12th and 13th? Same mornings as the peak of the Perseid meteor shower. So uh, on the morning of August 12th, Venus and Jupiter will be less than a degree apart. That's about two full moon diameters. It's less than the width of your pinky held at arm's length. So they'll be really close. And afterwards, Venus will continue moving slowly downward 
toward the sunrise and Jupiter will be sailing upward uh, into the eastern sky at dawn. And both of these planets will be sweeping past a whole host of stars and planets over the next few months. So you'll definitely want to start watching them now. But here's something else you might want to know. And that is by the end of August, we'll have six planets in the early morning sky. And here they are. This chart is for late August. So 2025 has been the year, right, Marcy, that suddenly everyone is talking about planet parades. Like if you have been watching the internet at all, you have probably seen that phrase. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. And we did have a really good planet parade in the evening sky in the early part of this year. But the fact is that we live in a solar system where all the planets orbit the sun on a single flat plane, more or less. And so when we look out into our sky, uh, we see the planets in a line like this always. <laughs> Nothing super special about that. It's just how nature works. And Marcy, you were telling me uh, earlier that we might not see all of these planets at once, right? That is correct. Uh, basically, Mercury is only going to be visible in morning twilight. You're not going to see it in a dark sky. So I'm thinking since Saturn is around a first magnitude brightness that you will probably no longer be able to, to see Saturn when Mercury is above the horizon. Venus and Jupiter are definitely bright enough that you can see them in the morning twilight. And you need optical aid to see Uranus and Neptune. So while they're all up there, I don't think you'll see them all at the exact same time. Yeah, so what seems to be happening is that people are looking on star apps and they're noticing all these names of planets visible. And so they're making videos about it and it's like, planet parade. But uh, you can need sky gurus like Marcy and me <laughs> to tell you what to really watch for. So do watch for Mercury around the end of August, like starting around mid-month. And in the last part of August, and do watch for Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. Like all of those are really bright. Uh, and here is number three on our must-see list of August sky sites. Let me introduce you to one of the biggest and brightest and most obvious pattern of stars in the August evening sky. This is called the Summer Triangle. This is actually made up of three bright stars, the bright star Vega, Altair, and Deneb. And in the summer, again, I'm in Wyoming, so our twilight lasts 60 to 90 minutes sometimes, so it takes a long time to get dark. And I love to just sit out there and watch those bright stars start, start to pop into the sky. You're going to see Vega first, and then Altair and Deneb come in about five or ten minutes later, and they're going to be high over the head. Uh, overhead in the sky. So this is really an obvious pattern of stars. And this is actual image of the sky from an all sky camera. And you can see how large of an area of a sky that the summer triangle covers in the sky. It's fairly um, large. Yeah, this is big. So and notice that Marcy is calling the, uh, one of these stars Deneb. And I call that star Deneb. So <laughs> We've had some comments recently about star name pronunciations, and normally I wouldn't even think about that because every single astronomy person that you talk to pronounces these names differently. So you can call them whatever you want or pronounce them however you want because there is no official pronunciation for any of this stuff. We all have our favorites. Um, so Marcy, <laughs> this summer triangle is not a constellation right? That is correct. It's what is called an asterism. An asterism is not a constellation. It's just a, an obvious pattern of stars that people are off, they're often well known and easy to pick out in the sky. So this particular asterism is made of the three bright stars, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And you'll see that they're in different constellations, Vega's and Lyra. Um, Altair is in Aquila, and uh, Deneb is in Cygnus. And also, if you're under a dark sky, 
the summer triangle is in right in the thick of that Milky Way that's stretching across the sky overhead. So definitely take, if you have binoculars, definitely take binoculars out and kind of scan along the Milky Way and through the summer triangle and you can see star clusters and nebulae and even like you'll see spots that don't appear like there's anything there that's actually dark nebula. So there's a lot of things you can see in binoculars along the Milky Way. It's it's beautiful. And, you know, you do need a dark sky to see it. So Marcy lives in rural Wyoming. I live in the middle of Austin, Texas. Uh, so I have no dark sky, but I love to see Marcy's pictures. Um, and that is one reason that the Milky Way is number four on our list of must-see August sky sites. And here's the Milky Way as seen by our friend, Amir Abdul Wahab. He's in the White Desert of Egypt, and that's a national park in Egypt. And I just wanted to show you this image. It's an artist's conception of what the Milky Way would look like if we could get outside it. So this is, uh, if we could get way outside our own home galaxy, the Milky Way, and look down on it, it might look something like this. It has that bar in the center, that bright bar, and these winding spiral arms. It's about 100,000 light years across. And you can see that little arrow down at the bottom pointing to a little circle. And that little circle is a thousand light year wide sphere of visible stars. So that's our little home sphere of stars within the larger Milky Way galaxy. And um, let's see what else we have here. Oh, yes. So this is showing the Milky Way edge on, or well, it's showing the top down view and the edge on view. And notice that those two arrows, those blue arrows. So there's our sun again, uh, located in the flat plane of the galaxy. So the Milky Way is flat like a pancake. And that's why at this time of year, when we look at the sky, we see that strip across the sky. That's really the edgewise view into our own galaxy. It's not dissimilar from the way that I mentioned earlier, we were seeing the planets. So it's in a flat plane and we're looking at it as kind of a line across our sky, except in the case of the Milky Way, it's a broad, bright line made up of billions of stars. And uh, this is a beautiful image by uh, Robert O'Farrell. Uh, he, I love this image because it shows the Milky Way We've got what looks like dawn coming up to remind you to look for the planets Venus and Jupiter in the early morning sky. And you can even see a meteor streaking along there. Uh, but before we go, I just want to bring back our favorite uh, <laughs> stargazer, uh, Bob King, also known as Astro Bob, to tell you why looking at the Milky Way is so wonderful exception i think people that have been out under a dark sky where the milky way really starts climbing above you late at night you stand underneath that thing and you know it's enormous it's an entire galaxy that's every single star in the sky belongs to the milky way and all the you know, extrasolar planets and nebulas and star clusters it looks to your eye and in your heart as big as it truly is and it will really dwarf you to stand underneath it. It's one of the best experiences, one of the best cosmic connection type experiences you can have. It just whoosh, instantly refreshes your perspective about your place in the universe. It does, doesn't it, Marcy? It truly does. It's amazing. Beautiful. It's wonderful. We are Earth Sky, uh, and we are here every... Uh, weekday at midday in um, North in uh, <laughs> North America, midday in North America. Uh, I'm Deborah Bird, and I'm Marcy Curran. One Earth, one sky, Earth sky. <laughs>